Acts chapter 14, verses 21 through 28. And when they had preached the gospel to that city and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. And when they had ordained them elders in every church and had prayed with fasting, they, commend, they commended them unto the, to the Lord on whom they had believed. And after they had passed through Pisidia, they came to Pamphylia. And when they had preached the word in Pergia, they went down to Attilia. And from thence sailed to Antioch, and from whence they had been recommended to the grace of God for the work which they fulfilled. And when they were come, they were gathered. They gathered the church together. They rehearsed all that God hath done with them, and how that He had opened the door of faith unto the Gentiles. And there they abode long time with the disciples. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, thank you for this passage. Thank you for the opportunity to study this uh, section where they confirmed the churches and and they ordained elders, and then they rehearsed back what they've done uh, to those that had sent them out and anointed them to preach the gospel and to and ordained them to the ministry of the Lord. And I just thank you for the opportunity to study this passage to understand the importance of the authority of the churches uh, in the ministry that we do. And just not pray. Amen. All right, so we've done a lot of, we've gone through this whole thing, through through this, uh, there were in, the, uh, in chapter 13, there were in the church that was in Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simon, that was called Niger and Lucas and Cyrene, uh, of Cyrene and Manian, which had been brought up with Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul, and they ministered to the Lord and fasted, and the Holy Ghost said, Separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. They were called, they were commanded by God to be separated into the work which they were called, a separate work from the church there in Antioch. You know, that church where there was established by the apostles in the authority that was given by to Barnabas uh, to establish that church. Barnabas was, went up from the side of the apostles that were in Jerusalem and established that church, and they uh, and then he went and worked there, uh, and then he was a good man full of the Spirit, and he went and got Saul, and then Saul came down as his assistant, and they both ministered a whole year with them in that church, and then God told them, "Hey, separate me unto the ministry which I have called them." They have known that they were called to this ministry, but yet we're not yet sending them out. But then they said, hey, now is the time God has called us to separate you uh, to this special ministry. Uh, so this ministry was under their authority, yet it was a separate ministry, uh, and that was the start of the missionary journey, the first missionary journey they were on. And then last week we were uh, studying uh, the missionary journey itself in chapter 14, and, and then the week before, the uh, the start of the ministry journey, and, and then that how he went through trials and tribulations and persecutions, and how that the uh, false uh, believers were uh, of the Jews were pursuing after them, uh, and they had great success. But with great success came great uh, persecution. Yet it did not scare them away. It's now it scared uh, John Mark away possibly, and, and that he had great concerns there, and probably drama of the ministry, having seen that Paul was taking the lead rather than Barnabas, and and different things were changing in the ministry, even though both were filled with the Holy Ghost, that doesn't mean that they're, uh, sometimes people think if you're filled with the Holy Ghost that you're going to be in perfect love and harmony and nothing is, is ever bad and you have, this, you have this idyllic futuristic thing, nothing ever bad happens because you're so filled with the Holy Ghost that you've transcended to some nirvonic state and that you, nothing ever affects you anymore. Uh, but we see that these people were filled with the Holy Ghost, yet... They had internal struggles. You know, John Mark, a good man, uh, and, and Barnabas, a good man, and Paul, a good man, and they, working together in the ministry, had struggles uh, outward and inward, they, even with the Holy Ghost. And see, because people don't suddenly become puppets, uh, you know, uh, of the Holy Ghost when they're filled with them, but rather uh, they are empowered to do the work through the ability that God has already given them, and through their temperaments and natures that they still have to work on. Uh, and so we understand that even if you have the right authority, you're still going to be you. Uh, it doesn't mean that, uh, it doesn't mean that well, okay, I'm, I'm out of the will of God, and so therefore I'm a bad person. A lot of good people do a lot of good things, but under the wrong authority. 
under the wrong uh, situation. They think, well, I'm going to go do this good deed for the Lord, but then they don't submit themselves to a local church or something like that. Uh, but Barnabas, uh, we see, uh, and, and in Paul, we see, they all submitted themselves to the local church, and then when the local church was ready and commanded by God to send them out, they sent them out under their authority. And then, so that's what they did. And so they finished their, they, they finished what they did, so now they're going back. Even though, uh, like the last, uh, in this last sermon, we talked about how he was stoned, but he got up and went back into the city and continued on with the disciples there. Uh, verse 19, And there came thither certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium, who persuaded the people, having stoned Paul, drew him out of the city, supposing that he had been dead. Uh, Howbeit, as the disciples stood around about him, he rose up and came into the city, the next day he departed with Barnabas and Derby. He just continued on doing what he was supposed to be doing. And, and so even though we have trials and tribulations and things, we just need to press on doing what God has called us to do. And that's what he did. Uh, and verse 21, And when they had preached the gospel in that city, which is Derby, uh, he had, and taught many, they were uh, they, they're doing the, God, the uh, Great Commission. Uh, you go into all the world uh, and preach the gospel, and then baptizing, and then teaching them everything that I commanded you. Uh, and so that's what they did. They were teaching them uh, the doctrine of the apostles, uh, the commandments of Christ, and so forth. And then after they taught many, they returned again to Lystria. So when they're teaching, pre preaching comes at the beginning of the Great Commission, baptism comes in the middle, and then teaching comes for the disciples. And so when they're teaching many, it means that they have disciples there. They have people that have been saved and baptized, and they're teaching them. Uh, and so that's the last part, the last section of the, of the Great Commission there. And they returned again to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch. And so the places where they went, Antioch of Pisidia uh, and so forth, they went right back to where they did. And what were they doing there? See, the, the gospel ministry is to, to do the whole package. Is to do the whole package is basically uh, to go preaching the gospel, find out who is following the Lord, who is not, and then they, when they went to these places, they basically went to the synagogues, uh, and then they separated in the synagogues the believers and then the unbelievers, and they had great success preaching the gospel of Christ, and that they were the Messiah of the Jews, and the believing devout Jews uh, followed after Paul, and the unbelieving Jews uh, divided from them. So we see the division. The believers who were ordained to life believed and converted to Christ, while the other ones persecuted. And so they had that division. They were divided uh, from one another. Uh, and so that's what Paul and Barnabas were doing. And then now they're going back trying to say, okay, where are the people that we've won to the Lord? A lot of times people say, well, uh, you know, all you have to do is, uh, as, a, as a preacher of the gospel, all you have to do is... is convert them, you know, get them saved, and then everything's up to them. But then here in these passages, we see that they went back, and they said, okay, the people we want to the Lord, did they actually get saved? Did they, did they actually continue on? Now, only between them and the Lord do they know if they trusted fully on Christ. But what they're doing is they're going back and saying, not only did they trust in the Lord, but are these people continuing in the faith that we've given to them? Right, and so there's a lot of people that are uh, that they, they trust in the salvation of Christ that, for the redemption of their sins, but then that's kind of where they stop. You know, the, uh, the proverbial person who is supposed to be in meat, but after 10, 20 years, they're still in milk. You know, they, they've never grown because they, oh, well, I got what I needed from the relationship with God. You know, uh, I'm not going to hell now. And so that's, uh, you know, I, I, as long as I got my free ticket, uh, you know, it's a bad idea and a bad thing to do. You better be careful because if you are truly saved, God's going to chasten you now that you want to live your own life and and act like act like that's all you need. You know, it, yes, salvation is a free gift, but if you live in sin and destruction and you have truly been saved, then you and your heart are not going to be happy anymore. You'd be like, man, I, I got the salvation thing to get me some, my, myself out of hell, but now that I have the Holy Spirit in me, I'm all miserable now. Uh, you know, I'm miserable. You know, it's it's similar to, like, like I said before, is that there, a lot of people are in their wilderness journey. They're saved, but they have not committed themselves to be a disciple of Christ. They have not transcended, transitioned from that thing. They're stuck uh, in between a lost world and a saved disciple world. They're not disciples of Christ. And what they wanted to do, because they had, they had converted these people, 
Uh, and then they wanted to come back and say, hey, uh, are they truly trusting? Are they building the church? What's going on? And so that they go back to where they had been uh, to, to verify these things. When they had preached the gospel to that city, they taught many. They returned again. And verse 22, and what were they doing? Uh, confirming the souls of the disciples. They were confirming them. Are they really disciples? See, they didn't say, well, we're going to investigate your salvation per se. What, what did they say? They're going to investigate and confirm that they're disciples, the souls of the disciples. And so those people, like, yes, there will be saved people that are not part of the church. They, they've not joined the church. They've not, they, they continue on with their life. They believe, they trust and believe on Christ for remission of their sins, but they're not joining the church. But there are some people that join the church and, and say, oh, I'm a disciple, but they're not really saved. And so what they're doing here is they're saying, hey, are the disciples who are gathering together uh, underneath the authority of, uh, you know, underneath believing in Christ and, and submitting one to another, are they all truly saved? You see, we don't need to investigate every single Tom, Dick, and Harry who is out in the world and, and then uh, who made a confession way back when. Uh, we don't need to investigate all those people, but we need to investigate who's in the church. Who, are they truly saved in the church? Is a church member who, who has full voting rights, are they truly a Christian? Because you cannot have an unbelieving church uh, membership. You, you can't have that. And that's what they're doing here. They're concern, confirming the souls of the disciples. And, and so while we're not going to be going uh, to every single person who, who, you know, like we're tracking them down and we're like Gestapo trying to find where they all are, uh, but if they're coming to the church, or they're gathering with the disciples. Or are they gathering as wolves? Or are they gathering as believers? All right, because remember, when they were going to the synagogue, you had, you had Old Testament Jews that were both culturally Jews, but not really believers, but they're joining together with the Jews because they were, it was their culture, it was the thing to do. Uh, but they were not believers. And because the, the proof of the pudding was when he preached the gospel, those who that were ordained to life among the synagogues believed and and cloaked together to the disciples uh, and, and so forth. And the other ones divided themselves uh, and showed that they were not really true. So what they're doing here is they're confirming that there are no uh, there are no wolves among the disciples, if you will. Uh, they had, uh, when they preached the gospel, uh, they would return to these places confirming the souls of the disciples. Why do they need to investigate the disciples and find out why the disciples are all saved? Because they're going to confirm a church. When, when you organize a church and you're organizing a church for the Lord, you cannot have unbelievers as a member of that church. And so you need to make sure that those disciples are truly disciples and not just there for fun or games or, or for because that's what I do in my culture and join with uh, is my history and culture. And, and they want to be a messianic Jew uh, pretending but not really accept Christ as their Savior. So the first thing you need to do when you're when you're confirming a church is you need to confirm the souls of the disciples, uh, and that's what they did. Because remember, the apostles were sent out to uh, do the work of the of the, the Paul and Barnabas were out sent out by the authority of the church to do the work of the apostles in confirming new churches. Uh, that's what their job was. That's why they were called apostles in the plural. In this chapter, uh, they called and, and uh, the. Let's say in verse uh, 14, which when the apostles, and then it says Barnabas and Saul, uh, were heard of, they rent their clothes and they ran in among them crying out. So they were under the authority of the apostles' ministry to do that. Now Barnabas wasn't technically of the twelve, uh, and Paul himself was kind of the, the apostle to the Gentiles and all this stuff, and there was a big debate on whether he was one of the twelve or not. Or, uh, the fact remains that there's twelve apostles of the Lamb, and then there are apostles with the authority to start churches that are not of the twelve. And, and so you've got to be careful of saying, well, Barnabas is called an apostle here, therefore he's an apostle of the twelve. No, he's not an apostle of the twelve, but he has the authority that the apostles had from Christ to start a church. Uh, to, to empower the church uh, and, and so forth. And so when they're confirming the churches, they got Jerusalem that was empowered, and then they uh, confirmed those in uh, in uh, uh, Philip in, in Samaria, and then they confirmed the ones in Antioch. And, and so now they're going to be confirming in every place that they went in those towns new churches with full authority. Those churches had full authority to uh, go out and do what Antioch did. 
send out missionaries, uh, do evangelistic work, and to uh, have pastors and things in offices. And so that's what they're doing here. But they did not, these believers did not just say, hey, we're all saved, we're all gathering together, let's appoint one of us among ourselves to do this. No, they received the authority from another church, which was Antioch, in, invested in Paul and Barnabas to do this authority. So Paul and Barnabas, the, the whole church did not, Antioch, the whole church did not go over and confirm them as a church to make another church. What they did was they confirmed, uh, uh, sent uh, Paul and Barnabas through the power of Christ to, to confirm these churches. They gave them the authority. So they, it's like transferring. If I had if I had a uh, cake and, and then instead of myself giving it to you, I, I gave it to uh, a messenger and then the messenger gave it to you, uh, would that be the messenger giving you this cake? Oh, yeah, it would be the messenger giving you this cake. But, but you would say, hey, this cake is not from messenger Paul and Barnabas. You would say this cake is from Antioch. The, this is what they gave to you. And so, too, the authority to be a church did not come from necessarily Paul and Barnabas, but it came from uh, the church in Antioch through the ministry that they were confirmed to do through Christ. Uh, and so, ultimately, came the authority to start this church came to, from Christ, but it came through the proper channels. And, and so, here, here is a confirming the souls of the disciples. See, before they're a church, they're believing disciples. You know, that's the end of the Great Commission, is to teaching, uh, teaching them all that I've commanded you, and then at the end of that Great Commission, you have uh, what is to be formed in the church. Uh, and so they're confirming the souls of the disciples, and then exhorting them to continue in the faith. So you're going to confirm their souls, exhort them to continue in the faith. In other words, uh, that has been delivered to the saints, that has been uh, theirs. It's not... It's not exhorting them to, con to continue in salvation, but to continue in faith. Faith is more than just salvation. Faith leads to salvation, but it also leads to discipleship. It also leads to sanctification and glorification, all these different things. Uh, but it is, uh, and the free gift is yours forever. Uh, that's, uh, that's from just believing. Uh, but the becoming a disciple, being part of a church, that takes greater faith. That takes a continuing faith. You can't just a, uh, uh, you know, salvation is forever, but a church is not. You know, a church is young, it, it, it grows, it, it, it dies, you know, it does, it's almost like a human being in that sense. It's a body that has age, it, it, it ages and it grows and it develops, it has different stages. Uh, and, uh, and when it's, it's born, when a baby is born, you don't just say, hallelujah, baby, have a good day. You're, you're your own person now. No, you raise it, you take care of it, and then one day, you know, the church decides, hey, you know, uh, it's, you know, your son decides, hey, you know, mom, dad, I'm going to uh, get married and start my own family now. And then at the wedding, what, did the, what does the minister say? Who gives this woman to be uh, whatever they say in all those marriages? I was kind of dazed in the things, so I don't remember. So, <laughs> but, but basically, who gives this woman to be his wife or whatever? And, and then uh, they leave father and mother and they cleave one to another. And so what you're going to see in this passage is they're going to leave Paul and Barnabas, and they're going to commend them to Christ. What does Paul say? Uh, I, I wish to give you without spot, uh, without blemish, to be a chaste version unto the, unto the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what he wanted to do. When he, when he left the church, when he commended them, he would commend them to the Lord. So too, when, uh, when, when uh, my father-in-law gave Bridget to me, he commended him unto me, he commended her unto me uh, to, to, to hold and to keep and, and to have. And, and that's the same way with the church, is that when they are young, they're underneath the authority of a parent church. They're underneath the authority of a church that says, hey, we're going to raise you, we're going to show you the things you need, we're going to give you the things you need to succeed in life. Uh, that doesn't mean that that church is going to ex exhort you into continuing in your birth that, that uh, you have. You know, No, they say continue growing in the faith that I've been teaching you, uh, the things that I've taught you. Continuing the faith means to, uh, you know, like Bridget sometimes says, didn't your mama teach you better than that? You know, and, then, and then I'll say, yeah, what my mama taught me and what I do are two different things. <laughs> So it's, it's the same thing is that, is that a church is exhorted to continue in the faith, the things that we've taught you, the apostles' doctrine, uh, the doctrines of Christ. 
and he says here, confirming the souls. Now, I just want you to do some quick definitions here as well. Now, nothing's ever quick here, but anyway. Uh, the confirm, uh, a verb, transit, uh, transitive, uh, Latin, to make firm. To, uh, it says to make firm or more firm, to add strength to, to strengthen, to help. Uh, as health is confirmed by exercise. Uh, definition number two, to fix more firmly, to settle or to establish. And then example is Acts 14 verse 1. Uh, now these, are, these definitions are from Webster's 1828. Uh, and he says, into this example, confirming the souls of the disciples, Acts chapter 14 verse 1. And then he says, I confirm thee into the priesthood. And that's taken from Maccabees. Uh, so, it confirmed there, when he's confirming the disciples, he's saying, are you guys ready to be your own church? Are you guys ready to be uh, given away in marriage to Christ, to, to be your own church, to be your own person? Uh, I don't have to keep coddling you. I don't have to keep teaching you. Are you ready to go? And, and, and so, to confirm their souls, to make sure that they're ready for what they're going to, be, they're going to have to be in. Uh, so, next definition, confirm, to crown me to be my, uh, confirm the crown to me to be my heirs is another uh, word uh, explanation. Uh, definition three, make, to make firm or certain, to give new assurances of truth or certainty, to put past doubt. And then the example, testimony of Christ was confirmed in you according to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 8. So he's confirming the testimony of Christ. Basically, you ask your, your church members, hey, can you give me your testimony of salvation as confirming their souls? Well, uh, I know there was something about faith involved and blood, but I can't really tell you. Then you need to confirm, are they really saved? Or, or they say, yes, I believe in the shed blood of Jesus Christ for the remission of my sins and that he, he, is, my, uh, he is my priest up in heaven interceding on my behalf so that I can have his power, his spirit. And then you're like, okay, good, good. As you're confirming the things that you were teaching them to be a church and to be a believer. Uh, the testimony of Christ confirmed to you, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 8. Uh, to fix, to eradicate as the patient is confirmed of dropsy, to confirm that something is in existence. Uh, verse uh, point five, uh, definition five, to strengthen, to ratify as to confirm as in agreement, to make it sure, to promise a covenant or title. And definition number six of confirm, uh, make more firm to strengthen as to confirm an opinion, a purpose, or a resolution. And the one I want to note here is the seventh definition in Webster's 828. 1828 is to admit to the full privileges of a Christian by the imposition of hands. And so we see here that when he's confirming the souls of the disciples, in, in Acts chapter 14, verse 22, he is confirming the souls of the disciples. He is, to, he is going to admit to full privileges of a Christian by the imposition of hands. That is what he is doing here in this passage. Uh, they are making sure that these people are ready to go when they're going to lay hands on these people to make them a full church. Remember that's what they did in uh, Samaria with, with, uh, with the church there. They laid hands on them. They received the gifts of the Holy Ghost. And, and then the church in Jerusalem, they received, uh, they received the Holy Spirit and so forth. <clears throat> and so in verse 22, he says, And exhorting them to continue in the faith, they confirmed them, and they're going to give them the full privilege. And then when, when, I, had, when I had an ordination, when, our, when we were ordained, uh, they, they, they exhorted us, the pastors that were there, they exhorted uh, us to continue preaching the gospel, to continue doing those things that we've been committed to. Uh, to continue doing those things that we are ordained to. And so, verse 22, he says that, and then he's confirming the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith. See, uh, churches need to be exhorted to continue in faith. That we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. And so, they have, they have been told, exhorting the faith, Notice this, he says, we must through much tribulation enter the kingdom of God. So the churches need to realize that they are going to be going through a lot of trials and tribulations as a church. It's not going to be easy going. Especially these younger churches who, in the same cities, the Jews that were in those cities that they were in, took the time and effort to take off work 
and to do whatever it does they did to pursue after the disciples to stone Paul and, and to do all those crazy things, just persecution after persecution, traveling hundreds of and like some of them hundreds of miles just to persecute these guys. And then here's these Jews that they're confirming the church is in. These Christians here, they have to live with these people. Probably even the same in the same family that they have to live with. And he says, you're going to have persecution. Those people that persecuted Paul and Barnabas and, and went to different cities, compassing land and sea to get to you, guess what? That's your father that did that. That's your mother that went along with them. That's your brother that did that. And you guys have to through much tribulation, live with these guys and have a church among them. Not only just live among them, but to gather together and assemble as a physical church of Christ, whom they think are heretics and have been persecuting us personally. And, and so we, we notice here that believers, when there, there's a special protection, when you are in a family as a child, there's a special protection to you. You, you, you earn $5 a week and you're like, oh wow, I'm rich now, you know? And then you, uh, but uh, as a as a parent, you were you you were uh, you you were five hundred dollars a week, and you're saying, man, how am I going to make ends meet? You, you know, uh, it, there's different protections. You have more expenses. You have different things. Uh, the dynamics are different. Uh, the privilege of being a smaller church under the authority of my sending church is the fact that we have a protection that is not afforded to a lot of other uh, that are churches that are on their own. Uh, we are like a baby uh, that can be coddled and protected and taken care of. And, and there are protections there uh, and, and so forth. The, the, the authority that another church has over them is a protecting authority uh, so that they can grow and develop in protection. Uh, and it's just like when a, a, a tree or a plant is growing in a greenhouse. Uh, it's protected from the, it's given the perfect environment to grow and it's protected from the outside elements. But once that tree is ready to be planted into somebody's yard as its own tree, as its own garden, or as its own plant, it no longer has the nursery. It has to stand up to the waves and the winds and the temperatures and, and the waterings and lack thereof, and it has to be able to survive these things. And it has to be planted in a good spot in order to be able to grow and develop. It, has, it can't just be tossed out into, into the road and say, okay, there you go, plant, grow. You know, it's in the middle of the highway. It's not going to grow, you know. It, going to get run over within two seconds. But if you find a good spot to plant that thing, then it's going to, and it gets the proper nutrition, uh, just like that Psalms 1 tree planted by the rivers of water in its due seasons and when and, and it will not wither and so forth. So you're, that's why it's important to confirm them, make sure that they're setting out right. Uh, and, and so it's, it's important. Confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith that we must through much tribulation. This is not just a Lone Ranger deal. We are independent Baptist churches. Yes, we're, we are independent. But it's not a Lone Ranger deal. It is not something that you just like, we're independent and we're not going to associate with any other people. You know, you need to get along with your brothers and sisters in Christ. You're, you're, not, just, you're not just going through tribulation by yourself. You, you need to make sure that, those, that you have a good relationship uh, with those around you, not just to make, pick fights with other believers, just to pick fights. You want to you want to be able to develop and grow together because we through much tribulation, uh, while we will yes we'll stand before God alone under in our a clear conscience before God alone, but we do the work together. Uh, we're to do it in edification. To to uh, he says we must through much tribulation, not just you guys by yourself through much tribulation. We all must do this. And this is part of growing up. We need to learn to, uh, to reconcile one to another, to make sure that there's peace among us uh, all, in all that there is in us. Why, why must we reconcile among the brethren to have peace? Even though we're separate churches, why should we have fellowship and, and to, at the very least, have peace among the brethren? It's because we, through much tribulation, we all are on the same team. Even if we have different views, different mindsets, different things, uh, different traditions, we need to be sure that we're not just picking fights because we need to pick fights, but rather that we, through much tribulation, because we have to face the world, principalities of the devil are out there, and a forest strong together is better than a, than, than a couple of trees in the middle of nowhere. And, and so that's why it's important 
uh, that realizing that you will gotta face the tribulation together. Much tribulation enter in to the kingdom of God. Now, now notice this is that the churches enter into the kingdom of God. Now we as individual Christians, uh, we through great violence, it says, uh, enter in to the kingdom. It says, and many men, Christ said, many men press into the kingdom of God. You know, it, it takes effort. It takes, it, you know, while salvation is free, it takes effort and, and willingness to forsake father and mother to be joined to Christ, to be joined unto the Lord. And to do that as a church, while individuals only have a certain lifespan, a church can last for many hundreds of years, many, many years. There are some churches in, uh, in, um, in America that have been here before 1776, before our founding, uh, before, uh, before the uh, declaration to be a nation. We were still part of uh, England, and there's still those churches having that tradition. You know, different generations, but that church is still here, and, and so forth. And so we, we know that there are churches that last a long time. Uh, and that they will go there. And, and then also that that church, uh, when you have a solid, church, strong church, is that you can cause that church to many, be there for many generations to be a strong uh, a refuge, a, a high tower, if you will, of God's, uh, of God's protection for many generations. But the thing is that churches will also grow and die and have that lifespan. But, but we need to remember that if we stay strong in our generation and hold this church for the next generation and so forth, that that church through much tribulation is going to have through generations struggles and tribulations and trials. Just because that church has been there for 150 years does not mean it's going to last your generation. It, it takes every generation. Uh, it takes a hard work. It's not going to be an easy thing to do. Uh, exhorting them to continue in the faith that we, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. You know, one day Christ is coming back, and then we're going to enter into that kingdom of God. We're going to be that church that enters into the kingdom of God. You know, not all of us are going to be there in the end, but, it, but we are going to be in that church in the kingdom of God, that when Christ returns, he's going to usher in the kingdom of God on this earth. And, that's, and then when we are there, we are going to be the church to the whole world. We, uh, the believers are the church to the whole world. There, it's going to take much effort. There's going to be a long time, is what he's telling them, is that this church, we want it to continue a long time. Uh, it's going to, uh, whether you as an individual will press in, you know, either through rapture or through, uh, through death, uh, enter into heaven and then return with Christ, entering into the kingdom. And, and then a lot of saints, they were beheaded for the witness of, of Christ and they had much tribulation and trials to get there. But that church, if it wants to survive, is going to have to go through a lot of trials, is what this passage is saying. And it's not going to just be one or two generations, it's going to be until Christ comes back. The uh, Bible talks about how that we are going to preach the gospel in the whole world and then the end shall come. And then even other churches, they're going to have tribulation 10 days, and they're going to have trials and tribulations and so forth. And so don't think that just because you're an established church that you're going to have it easy. It is going to take a lot of effort is what he's telling them. He's telling them it's not going to be this Joel Olstein style of ministry where if you're doing everything right, then you're going to have uh, peaches and cream and, and all the delights of this world, but rather you're going to, this is your future. Trials, tribulations, uh, great effort, uh, uh, ex remaining in the faith, uh, and to confirm the, those souls. He says, much tribulation entered the king God, and when they had ordained them elders in every church. They're no longer disciples, but they're now a church. They've ordained elders every church, every assembly. Uh, and so when you're making a church, you need to confirm their souls, make sure that they're saved, and then you exhort them to continue in the faith together, we being we, not just individual persons, not just individual churches, but we as the body of Christ must go in. And then also that church in particular, that you together must enter into this tribulation. And when they had ordained, when they had ordained them elders in every church, see the apostles were the ones that ordained the elders, and, and so forth. And so we see how that they were confirmed there. So when we are organized, we're going to ordain 
uh, an elder. We're going to make sure that this church has a good uh, leader in this church. And uh, if that's me or that's another person, what's important is that leader is ordained in the proper authority uh, by somebody that they've chosen, that they've picked out. And it was from among that church. They didn't say, and we, and we ordained this stranger from far, far away. Here you go. Have, have at it. But no, notice there what it says. It says, when they had ordained them elders in every church. These were elders that were from among them. They were there in the church and that they were faithful. This perhaps maybe was uh, uh, somebody, you see, what's neat about the synagogue is the fact that they were in one sense already a church, the Old Testament church. And they had some sort of structure there already. And they also had, later on you'll see passages where it talks about how that Jason was uh, the leader of the synagogue. And then when he converts to, to Paul and Barnabas, and, or, or Paul and Silas, or, or wherever, uh, when it gets to the passage exactly who it was, but basically, and then it says, the new leader of the synagogue comes and persecutes him. You know, his house is right next to the old synagogue, and when he, the leader of the synagogue, converted to Christ, uh, the, the synagogue and the Jews went after him. Uh, and, and so there was trials and tribulations there. But here we see that, uh, that, uh, that they had ordained them elders in every city. And those elders are people that were, uh, were already educated, uh, especially with the synagogues. A lot of people say, well, uh, here's these churches. They were only there for a few weeks in each one or, or, or at the most several months or whatever it was. And, and uh, why would they confirm such a church? Remember, these people from, from birth in the Old Testament were raised in synagogues. You know, Christ was raised in synagogue, and, and these were the Old Testament churches. And when they converted to Christ, basically they switched the placard on the front from uh, Old Testament church to New Testament Baptist church, you know, whatever. Uh, and they they made and uh, or they uh, or they had a church split, if you will. The Old Testament unbelievers stayed over there and had their false religion, and the New Testament believers went with Christ and and, and put up their new church sign and so forth, and and they uh, and they went on serving the Lord. Uh, but here I want you to notice that they ordained them elders in every city. They didn't say, okay, you guys continue in the faith. You're going to have much tribulation. Uh, hope you guys pick some good leaders. They made sure they were correct because they did it before they gave them, uh, before they became a, a self-sustaining church. See, at this time they're ordaining elders in the church, uh, but they have not yet given them over to the Lord for safekeeping. Uh, but let's look at this word ordain. It's a verb. Transitive, uh, Latin, ordeno, <laughs> from ora, orios, from order. And this doesn't say orios, I just made that up. But anyway, that says ordo. Uh, and it says, the, the first definition, properly, to set, to establish in a particular office or order. Hence, to invest with a ministerial function or secretarial power, to in introduce and to establish or settle in the pastoral office with the customary forms and solemnities as to ordain a minister of the gospel. In America, men are ordained over a particular church and congregation, or as an evangelist without the charge of a particular church, or as a deacon in the Episcopal church. And definition two, to appoint, to decree. And it says, Jeroboam ordained a feast in the eighth month, First Kings chapter two, 12, verse 32. And as many as were ordained to eternal life believed, Acts chapter 13, verse 48. And definition three, to set, to establish, to institute, to constitute. And so they set and established them as the leaders uh, to make sure it was clear who was running this church. It wasn't just kind of like a lot of people, a lot of times they say, well, we just going to have a you know, nice little discipleship in our house and, and whoever has a word or two, or, uh, then they can get up and, and, and give their mind and, and, and this is how they feel and, and, and just kind of very synagogue-y and, and, and very kind of no authority there, but really just kind of whatever is on your heart, you just share it with the group and, and it can be a heresy, it can be just kind of a thought, it can just be kind of like, oh, that's kind of cool, uh, but then no exhortation. Because if there's no authority, there's no authority to exhort. Uh, because if you are just sharing among equals, there is no there is no right to exhort. You can't admonish your brother with no authority. But here we have an ordained to set to to set an elder, somebody who is older than you, to be above you, uh, and, and submitting one to another, and also a leader in the church. 
to set, to establish, to institute, to constitute. Uh, definition four, to set apart for an office to appoint. It's a set apart office. You must be an ordained leader of the church. And not just ordained by your own authority. Oh, I just started this church. I didn't come along here and set a plaque on this building or whatever and set a sign outside and, and say, okay, we're having church. Uh, I, I was sent here to do this. It wasn't just something I felt like, well, I did desire it, you know, obviously, but, uh, but it was not under my authority. It was the under authority of my sitting church. It says, to appoint, to prepare. And it says, for Tophet is ordained of old. And if you know what Tophet is, that's the, uh, when God tosses them in the great wine press of the wrath of God, they're going to toss the bodies after they're all pressed out into Tophet, which is a valley that's going to be so full, you know, the blood that's pressed out of his wrath of God is going to be up to the horse's bridle, and then the body is pressed out. It's kind of gross, but, it, uh, but the verse Isaiah chapter 30, verse 33 says, Tophet is ordained of old that the wrath of God to dividing the, the unrighteous from the righteous in Israel is going to be ordained. It, it's ordained. And then also, Titus chapter 1, and that was, I brought that up because it's part of the definition to appoint or to prepare. Uh, and the Titus chapter 1, verse 5, uh, Paul is talking to uh, Titus, one of his converts and one of his dearly beloved uh, followers, and, and he treated him like a son, uh, close, close, uh, disciple all the teaser together uh, let's see Thessalonians Timothy then Titus Titus chapter 1 verse 5 alright for this cause left I thee in Crete that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting and ordain elders in every city as I have appointed thee see Timothy had the authority from Paul who had the authority from Antioch to do these things and so Paul the apostle having been appointed an apostle by God and then set aside for that ministry by the church of Antioch uh, now has the authority to invest this authority in to Titus uh, to appoint in the churches that they start. You see, missionaries uh, appoint the pastors in the church they start. Uh, they and it says, "For this cause I left thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting." That's confirming the souls, making sure that everybody's faithful, making sure that everybody's organized into the church format. That when they leave, that that church will sustain itself and survive and live on. And, and things that if they're not qualified. And he says, to, in order that they are wanting to ordain elders in every city, as I appointed thee, and then Timothy, this is what you're going to have to look for. If any be blameless, husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of right or unruly, for a bishop must be blameless. That's where we get the connection. They ordain elders in every city. And then here is the connection to bishops, uh, ordaining uh, as he has appointed thee. And he says, the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine or striker, not given to filthy lucre, but to lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able to, by sound doctrine, both to exhort and convince the gainsayers. And, and so this is very important because if you're, if you're putting hands suddenly on, on just anybody who is not able to... Uh, to teach what he's been taught, then you're breaking the chain. You're not doing things right. Well, what if I'm just collecting the best from everybody? No, that's not what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to learn from, uh, Paul says, be followers of me as I follow up to Christ. You have to follow after your leaders. Now, uh, will your leaders be perfect? No. But the, the, he's not ordained you to learn from every commentary out there. He's not ordained you to learn from every uh, YouTube video out there. Uh, he's not ordained you to uh, to learn from. Now, are these things good? Are commentaries good? Are, are these can they edify? Yes, they can. But there there is no authority in, in YouTube. There is no authority in commentaries. There is no authority in in, in, in one sense of the word. There is no authority in uh, black and white pieces of paper. The authority is invested in men of God. Now, should those men of God be following the scriptures? Yes. But the authority is vested in those men of God who have been commissioned and given to the word of truth, uh, those teachings. Uh, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that we may be able to, to uh, by sound doctrine, both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. See, uh, the Bible teaches us our doctrine. 
and it's all authority. Uh, but to express that authority in life, if this Bible is just closed, there's no authority there. But we open it up and we read it and we exhort it and we and we proclaim it and we try to place it into our lives, then it is all authority. It, it, it's given there by the by the uh, by the execution thereof. Uh, and, and so it's very important to understand that the authority is there, but it's only by proper channels. Uh, for there are many unruly vain talkers. There are people that sit around all day talking about things of the Bible, armchair theologians, that they have no authority, but they tell you how you're supposed to live your life and who's supposed to be ordained among you and who and, and what doctrine is right, what doctrine is wrong. You don't know who they are. Do they struggle with you? Did they weep with you? Did they go through much tribulation with you? No, they did not. You need to understand and realize that while commentaries and, and other people outside of the local church are good, uh, and, and they have their place, you need to realize it is the local church that struggles with you, that prays over you and weeps when you're hurting, and, 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 and is there for you. And, and so they must have much more authority in your life than somebody hundreds of, hundreds of thousands of miles away who have no care for you. And, and so it's important, while yes, they can be edifying and they can help you grow, you must be able to apply that locally in that authority that God has given to you locally. For there are many unruly and vain talkers. They, they, unruly means they don't have rule over their lives. They decided, now, could the person be good or, 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 or have good intentions? Yeah. But why, what makes them unruly? They have no rule. They, they have no authority. Uh, they did, they're doing it all themselves. Oh, this looks cool. Let's go do this. It's like, hey, let's go to the beach today. Hey, let's go start the church today. Hey, let's go, let's go bungee jumping today. Hey, you know, it's like, why? You, you don't have the right to do that. You know, Simon the Sorcerer, hey, I want to go lay hands on people and give, give these things for, for hire. $100 for the gift of healing. $1,000 for the gift of tongues. And no, no, you don't have that authority. That's not of yours. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision. Remember Acts chapter 15, except you be circumcised. You know, uh, they're, they're trying to do these things that they don't have the authority to do. There are certain brethren that have no authority, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses. You know, doctrines of people that are not in your local congregation will creep in, and what will they do? They'll subvert whole houses, causing to break up the local church. You know, Maybe your church is flawed. Yeah, you're most likely going to have flawed doctrine in your church. But you need to do those struggles together. You, need, you must have the willingness to come together and, and have those struggles as, as a church together, not uh, in some mystical, ethereal place called the Internet. You must have it locally uh, among the brethren. Uh, and so those outside forces whose mouths must be stopped, uh, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not, for filthy lucre's sake. That's why I'm not a big fan of... Now, now I'm not going to fight this or argue about this, but people that sell religious books, you know, of, of making of books, there is no end. Uh, and trying to have people follow after their doctrines and their books and their videos and things like that. For, for you know, they say, my intellectual property, my, my, my books and things and stuff. And now if somebody wants to write a novel or something like that, that's fine. But, but the Bible says that, uh, and, and yeah, I understand that people, uh, they put a lot of work in commentaries and things. And if you can find a good commentary, you want to buy it and stuff. Now, I'm not arguing back and forth on whether or not people should be doing that. But they are teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. Whenever money enters into the equation, maybe the guy has good intentions. But what if he tweaks it a little so he can just get a few extra bucks? You know, what if he, the, the desire to, to get the, the word out there, to, to have teaching out there, what if it's a popular teaching, I'm going to just kind of write a book on this fluff piece, and just kind of, for filthy lucre's sake, and then I'm going to, well, if I make this controversial, rather than teaching it regular, then I'm going to get more viewers. Because why? People are gathered to the fire, like moths to a flame, and, and they're going to want, and because you'll get more money through it. Um, when you make excitement or, 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 a, or a big fight or fire over the thing, uh, you know, the, the, the tongue is a little member, but uh, it can and set on course the flames of fires of hell, you know. Uh, and so you've got to be careful who you're following because what are their intentions? Whenever money is involved, whether innocently or 
or what or whatever their doctrine is, when filthy lucre sake, when they get money some way, somehow, through some channel, you've got to be very careful. And now, and, and, and so I'll, I'll stop there on that because I don't want to spend too much time on that. And there's there's a whole teaching on that I could do. But one of themselves, even a prophet of their own, he's talking about people in Crete now. He said, the Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, and slow bellies. Uh, the witness is true. Wherefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. That's talking about the local church. I'm not supposed to go off on... On, on internet land, uh, trying to rebuke the invisible brethren out there. Uh, I need to rebuke those that creep into our church sharply. Uh, and, and so now, now I'm not going to be going around <laughs> getting mad at everybody. No, I'm not doing that. But but whereas they are trying to do this filthy lucre state, uh, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith, not have, giving heed to Jewish fables. No Hebrew roots movement in here, buddy. You know, none of that garbage. No, no, I'm not taking heed to fables like Book of Enoch and all that garbage. Uh, and so, this witness is true. Wherefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men, commentaries, commandments of men, uh, commentaries of men. Uh, but anyway, I'm not, I should stop on that because there are good commentaries. I'm not down on all of them. I like some. Uh, what that turn from the truth. Uh, they want to develop a controversy, sell more books or whatever. Unto the pure, all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. Is there anything sacred in your life? You should, you should make sure that your pastors, your elders, hold things sacred. There's a lot of people that when a controversy comes up, the first thing they attack is your salvation. There's a lot of, con when controversy comes up, the first thing they attack is the local church or, or the authority of that local church to be a church. And then what they do is... Nothing is pure to them. Nothing is sacred. You know, Ampa, it's, they may be right in certain things that when they come and, and controversy comes, but you better be very careful when you question somebody's salvation. You better be very careful when you turn and beat another man's servant. We all stand before God alone at judgment. You best not be trying to beat another man's servant unless you have good cause to accuse him and that he is hurting others. The only reason we... We are, we are to edify, and the only reason we are to, to condemn or, or curse another man is if they themselves are hurting the body of Christ and destroying it, but if they are just you know off somewhere or, or something, we're not supposed to destroy them. We're supposed to edify them, to correct them, to help them, uh, and so forth. Rebuke them sharply to edify them, to make them sure that their doctrine is correct. But to them that are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. Everything's fair game. You better watch out for those people who seem to be godly, but their religion is vain. They, everything's fair game to accuse brethren of every single thing under the sun. You better be very careful of that, uh, and especially when they're not local. You've got to be very leery of things you see on the Internet, because they don't know who you are. They don't care about you. They only care about filthy lucre, their, their agenda. But even their mind and conscience is defiled. They profess that they know God, there's a lot of people that say, I am saved, don't question me. Uh, but in works, they deny him. Well, what are their works? Are they, are they edifying or are they abominable? What are they doing? Uh, and disobedient to everything, every good work reprobate. So, why is there authority? Why do you ordain? Why do you make sure that people are blameless? It's because you want to make sure that that local church has every chance of succeeding. Because if you, have, if you lay hands suddenly on somebody who seems to be religious... I can't hold his tongue, he can't hold, and he can't, and has a bad evil spirit. Oh, but the guy knows 37,000 verses of the Bible. I don't care. If the guy has a bad spirit, you better watch out. Because he's going to destroy that church, he's going to defile his people, he's going to ruin that church, and they're going to be twofold more the child of the devil, thinking that they're doing God a service. So the authority is very important to make sure that they ordain properly in the local church and to make sure that they have the proper authority, making sure that they have the proper qualifications, studying things that are out of order. And so we have here, and, uh, and after that they had, um, and they, and they did, ordained elders in every church and prayed with, and, and they had ordained them elders in every church and they prayed with fasting. They, they prayed so fervently they skipped lunch. You know, in this ordination service, they skipped lunch. You know, hey, that's not going to happen in Baptist Church, I guarantee you. None of that. It's going to be prayer and feasting. I'll tell you what, that, that is just incorrect doctrine. The Greek there, if you go back into the Greek, it says feasting. 
I'll tell you what, that is just not correct there. This Zondervan Bible here I got has the wrong wording there. It is supposed to be feasting. I guarantee you. That's something different for us. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'll just try to defend my own <laughs> slow belly here. <laughs> Filthy liquor sink. <laughs> anyway, uh, so we understand they skipped lunch to pray. Because that was how serious it was. They weren't going to hang, be hanging around here. That was that was their last day there. They were going they were going on, so they were made, they were very serious about this. You know, when a Baptist skips, skips lunch, it's very important. Uh, and they had ordained them elders in every city. They prayed with fasting and commended them to the Lord. Commended them to the Lord. Notice this word commended. It says it says to represent as worthy of notice, regard of or kindness, to speak in favor of, to recommend. I commend to you Phoebe, our sister. When she was sent to another church, he, Paul commended her. Uh, and a lot of times Baptist churches will, uh, by letter, recommend their member to another member's church. Uh, and so forth. And, and things. Here we do it by word of mouth. Hey, are, are you good with your, are you okay to join? Or is everything good? Yeah, we're good. Uh, but sometimes churches have a question, and so they send a letter along where they give you a letter uh, when you leave the church, if you if you leave this church for any reason and, and stuff, and you desire for a letter uh, to take with you to your new church, we'll very very much well do that for you. And so that that's just fine to do. Uh, to uh, to commit, to entrust, or to give charge, uh, according to uh, Luke chapter twenty three verse forty six, Jesus Christ said, "Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit." He gave his spirit to God. Uh, and then definition three, to praise, to mention with appropriation. The prince committed Sarah before Pharaoh. That's how Pharaoh found out about her. Uh, he, he, she was sent up to Pharaoh. Uh, and then the Lord commended the undressed steward because of his actions. Uh, to, and definition four, to make acceptable or more acceptable. But meat, but meat commendeth not to God. First Corinthians chapter eight, verse eight, meaning that meat does not... Uh, make you acceptable unto God. So if you have meat practices that are good or bad, it, it doesn't do you any good. You need spiritual things, not physical. But definition five: to produce or to present a to favorable notice, the, the chorus had an occasion to commending their voices to the king. Uh, definition six: to send or to bear to. These draw chariots with litimus sins and rich presents to the prince's commends. Now I guess that's that's uh, Shakespeare's. Uh, and to, to send or to bear to. So uh, they commended uh, them to the Lord. They Just like Christ commended his spirit unto God, uh, so too they took this church that has been newly formed, and instead of having the apostles, the authority over it, as in the, you know, the, a lot of people say, well, you, like the Greek church will have, a, have a, an apostle or something, or, or, or whatever they call them, uh, a bishop over a lot of churches. And that they would, and, and they would do that. But here we see that the apostles, uh, and, and their authority of the apostles, Paul and Barnabas, organized that church, set them in order, and then they took that church and gave it as a chaste virgin, virgin unto the Lord, commended it unto the Lord. So once they committed them unto the Lord, then they became an independent church. Because why? The church is now the Lord's, and not Paul and Barnabas as the missionaries. Not Antioch's uh, daughter church. You know they were the Lord's. They were given over to the Lord, as in marriage. They were committed unto the Lord, uh, and to every church. And, and then they uh, and then they say they committed them unto the Lord on whom they believed. They believed. They raised them up. They they fulfilled the great commission in them, and then they organized them and they ordained elders, and then they committed them unto the Lord. See, there is no whole thing, this whole thing of, you know, until the, that some guy just sets up a church and all of a sudden it's a church. No, you have to have the authority in place, and then when it's organized, you commend it unto God, then it's its own entity. The apostles no longer have the authority over this church. Now, they can give recommendations and suggestions, but then that church is its own entity. They are committed unto God. God is now their head. And, they had, and then he says, on whom they have believed. So God started it, and at the end, he received it. 
And after they had passed through Pisidia, they came to Pamphylia, and when they had preached the word in Pergia, they went into Attilia, and, and the indication is that in each of these cities, they did all the same thing. They, they did all this. They, they had a church to sell it. And they sell it to Antioch, from which they had been recommended to the work of the grace of God, to the work which they fulfilled. Now notice they're recommended. Uh, it's commended, to, to commend again. See, they were sent out to do the work, and then now that they're back, if they get, they're going to get this testimony of what they've done, they're going to be re-recommended. Uh, he's going to go on a second missionary journey later on. Uh, he is commended back to the work. Hey, you did a good job. Let's go out and do it again. Uh, and so he says, uh, from once they had been recommend, recommended uh, to the work, to the grace of God for the work which they had fulfilled. So they went back to where they started. They reported back, and you guys did a good job. We're going to do it again. Well, let's do this thing again. Uh, and they were, and when they were come, they gathered the church together. They rehearsed all that God had done with them, and how that they had opened the door of faith unto the Gentiles. They had opened the door of faith unto the Gentiles. And so, so here we see that uh, they, they, their job was to open the door of faith. So now these churches are all independent churches with Jew and, and Gentile in them, and the majority of them are Gentile. Uh, and they start with the synagogue, obviously, but that, now they're gathering their, their Christians first, and then they had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. It is no longer just a Jewish operation, uh, a Jewish church. It is now a Christian church, uh, and they had opened the door of faith. And so that's the job of every church is to open the door of faith to all those who can hear. Uh, that, that is your job. It's not just the job of the apostles. It's the job of the church. When they were come, they had gathered the church together. They rehearsed all the things that God had done with them. They rehearsed it. You know, when, uh, when we go back on furlough from being a missionary, well, what we do is say, hey, here's the church we started in Taidong. Here's the church we started in Kaohsiung. Here's the, start, the church we started in Taidong. And, and, and we'd list and rehearse to every church that we have support at. We would go to this church, and then they, we'd go to another church uh, that had given our, you know, as kids, we, uh, our parents support. They would rehearse the same things. They would tell what they did in each place and, and what they did in all these places and, and then they would rehearse it and how that God had done with them and how that they had opened the door of faith unto the Gentiles and there they abode long time with the disciples they took time to, to tell them what they did so that when they saw the work they glorified God and so forth and, 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 and they did all those things but you know they, they, they rehearsed it to repeat the words of the passage or composition to re repeat the words to another to narrate or recount the events of the transactions. That's why that's why we have a record of what they did. Because you know, uh, Luke, when he was writing these books down, he had a record, and then they rehearsed them in all the churches. So it's not like it's not like in the middle of nowhere, Luke is secretly writing uh, the book of Luke and and, and the the Acts of the Apostles. And hey, hey, guess what we were doing. Oh, we didn't know you guys were doing that. How did we know that? No, no what he's saying, he's writing down things that were already rehearsed in all the churches. And the, everything the apostles did was always in the open. It was never a secret activity that 20 years after the fact, oh, we got this word. You know, there were copies and copies, and they were shared and everything. They were rehearsed. And so we need to know that this is not just something, the, the activities that they've done here and how they organize churches and how that they ordain people, they're not just some made-up thing that we're just throwing out of thin air. These are things that are rehearsed in all the churches. And so when we realize and understand that we are following the tradition that is set down in the book of the apostles, we need to make sure that this, that this tradition doesn't end with us. Uh, that because of tribulation and different ideas that are popping up and people with slow bellies and vain ideas that are coming along, no, we, we're going to stay with the book. We're, we're, going, to, we're going to be recommended to the Lord uh, in the proper way. We're going to make sure that everything is decently ordered. Not because if we get one thing out of order, all of a sudden the chain of authority breaks down and, oh, no, how dare, you know, there's this theory out there that says, oh, you know, if you don't have everything in the proper order, then you're not, you're not a proper church in the eyes of God. Well, well, the thing is that when you're commended unto God, he'll set those things into order. 
And, and if somebody has something out of order, or a church has something out of order, they can reset it. It's not like this hard and fast rule. But the thing is that you need to make sure that you're following the scriptures in the proper way in organizing your church. And that's what we're going to strive to do here. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this passage. Thank you for the opportunity to understand and study uh, the missionary journeys of Paul the Apostle and Barnabas and how that they uh, did things decently in order under the, the proper authorities that they did and realize that these things are important because you've ordained them to be this way. Lord, I pray that you'll help us to understand and realize the proper authorities in order to be, uh, to be a proper church and to one day be under your authority alone uh, as a full-fledged church. Lord, I just, help you I just pray that you'll help us to uh, go down the proper path that you separate. Amen.